It's a good morning to you. Welcome to Asake Online. My name is Zenzel Ndegele, and this is uh, not the breakfast club, but a special live stream, where today we are going to be having a lecture, you know, public lecture. Uh, we, in the past, we've done a few of these things where we have talked to uh, different people giving us uh, uh, you know, topics or talks on uh, important uh, uh, topics in our Zimbabwean politics mainly and um, Zimbabwean situation. And as you know, that this month, the Center for Innovation and Technology site is actually running a film festival uh, whose theme is in search for peace and justice. And uh, it wouldn't have been any better or what else could be better than actually hosting uh, today uh, a historian, uh, Stuart Doran. I think many of you would uh, know him because I've, I've, I've talked to a few people and they, they've really talked about his book and many people were looking forward to, to this discussion that we're going to be having today. Um, lots of questions, lots of, uh, uh, you know, anxiety, but Interestingly, uh, I've been reading his book the past two weeks, and it, it's really loaded with a lot of information uh, when it comes to issue of Kukura. And there, you know, I was just talking to Stuart uh, Doran, and I, I realized that he's actually a Bulawayo boy, having grown up in Bulawayo and uh, done some way part of his primary school in Bulawayo. So, Siakwa Mgela Babu Doran, I mean, feel at home, although we are online because of uh, COVID. So, without uh, uh, wasting time, I would introduce uh, Stuart Doran who will be giving us a talk on um, why the international community turned the blind eye on Kukura Undi. I hope you enjoy this conversation. Over to you, Stuart. Uh, yeah, so I've been asked to speak on the question of why the international community turned a blind eye to the Kukura Undi. Um, the wording of the talk, as it's been advertised, is an adequate description of the broad topic but I want to suggest that a little more precision would be helpful. Firstly, the term international community works all right as a shorthand or synonym for foreign countries, but that's about where its usefulness ends. There's no such thing as the international community in the sense of a body of nations that's able to act in a unified manner with regard to matters of international interest. When it comes to the involvement of foreign countries in Zimbabwe during the 1980s, we're better off dividing them into three general categories and then talking about the individual countries within each category. So I'm going to discuss how each of the following three groups reacted to the Gukara Hundi. Former ZAPU allies, ZANU allies and Western countries. Another way of dividing it would be African states, communist bloc countries, and Western nations. But let's, let's, let's stick with uh, ZAPU allies, ZANU allies, and Western countries. A second element where we need a, uh, a bit more precision is the idea that foreign countries turn a blind eye to the Kukarahundi. In and of itself, that's not a satisfactory summary of what actually happened. Some countries actively assisted ZANU-PF during the Gukara Hundi, while in the case of Western countries, the reality was more complex than the term blind eye might suggest. Western countries did different things at different points. Remember that there were two five brigade deployments in two different provinces over two different years. So this wasn't a single event. At certain critical points, Western nations acted. And even though the response was relatively weak, those actions had an impact. There were also points where a response was occurring, but it was slow and lackadaisical in relation to the circumstances. And then there were indeed points at which the response can be described as one of deliberate inaction. I'll talk more on these aspects in due course. <clears throat> Five Brigade was deployed in Matabililand North on the 20th of January, 1983, allegedly in response to an upsurge in dissident activity. It's outside the scope of this talk for me to describe the full context, but the key takeaway is that the official narrative is propaganda. <clears throat> 
the operation had everything to do with politics, co-mingled with tribalism and other animosities, and little to do with a much hyped military or security threat. In pursuit of a one-party state, Mugabe and the ZANU-PF leadership wanted to liquidate ZAPU and its support base by the time of the first post-independence elections. And the occupation and decimation of the ZAPU heartland in rural Matabililand was viewed as a key part of that process. ZANLA had never controlled those areas during the war and ZANU-PF had no party structures to speak of in Matabililand. The official line was that five brigade had been deployed to combat an insurgency, but there's a sense in which the opposite was true. This was an injection of ZANLA forces into an area that had been beyond their reach during ZANU's insurgency of the 1970s. The other driver of the operation was the sheer hostility and hatred that many in ZANU felt for ZAPU and its supporters. This had its roots in the party split of the 1960s and in the further exacerbation of the inter-party rivalry during the war. The immediate backdrop post-independence is that Mugabe had been enraged by Joshua Nkomo's refusal, refusal to merge ZAPU into ZANU, despite the massive pressure that had been placed on the ZAPU leader between 1980 and 1982. The two leaders had met for the final time on the 14th of January, 1983. And, and there can be little doubt that Nkomo's failure to come on bended knee was the last straw in Mugabe's mind. It's no coincidence that five brigade was sent into Matabililand only six days later. The first battalion of the brigade was deployed to Nkai, Lupane and Trolocho transiting through Bembesi and Bubi, while the 2nd Battalion was sent to Silobela. Public reports of mass killings emerged within a week of deployment. ZAPU MPs, led by Sidney Malunga, reported the atrocities in Parliament, and Nkomo called a press conference the next day, during which he said there'd been a massacre in which an estimated 95 people had died. Foreign journalists reported these statements in the international press and then made field trips to Matabililand, which resulted in further reports of large scale killings. Therefore, while the government made strenuous efforts to rest restrict the flow of information, and was largely successful within Zimbabwe due to its control of the newspapers and ZBC, there was from early on a stream of international reporting on the situation. So what were the international players doing during this period? ZAPU's most important wartime ally, Kenneth Kaunda Zambia, seems to have gone completely missing in action during this period saying and doing nothing about the plight of ZAPU and its supporters. The writing had been on the wall since as, er since as early as January 1981, when Kaunda had indicated publicly that Zambia was not going to become involved in a tussle between ZANU and ZAPU. In other words, the message from Kaunda to Nkomo had been something like this. You're an opposition leader now and you're on your own, Ndala. I won't be calling you and don't call me. The ultimate illustration of Kaunda's determination to wash his hands of Nkomo was Zapu's refusal to provide refuge for the, uh, sorry, it was Zambia's refusal to provide refuge for the Zapu leader in March, 1983, when at the height of the Gukurahundi, Nkomo had fled the country after an attempt had been made to assassinate him in Bulawayo. Zapu's other wartime sponsor had been the Soviet Union, and it too had cut Nkomo loose and was engaged in a resolute and somewhat desperate effort to carry favour with the ZANU-PF government. 
Mugabe and company had little love for the Soviets after being treated like wannabe leaders of a second-rate nationalist splinter movement. So they were making the Russians grovel in their attempt to establish an official relationship with the Zimbabwean government. By 1983, the Soviet relationship with Zaku was a, was a distant memory. And the last thing the USSR was going to do was provoke Zona PF by providing even rhetorical support for its former ally. The Russians, like the Zambians, refused to provide sanctuary from Cornwall after the from Cornwall after the assassination attempt. Zapu's smallest former friend, Botswana, did remain sympathetic and provided a degree of low key assistance. It gave him Cornwall a place to stay after he crossed the border and allowed him time to organize travel to Britain. By this time, Botswana had also accepted thousands of Ndebele refugees who had fled Matabele North, and it refused to hand over those among the refugees who were sought by Zona Pierre for political reasons, a position that didn't endear Botswana to the Mugabe government. And there was a considerable amount of sabre rattling on the Zimbabwean side. A compromise was negotiated in mid-1983 when the two governments signed a cooperation agreement and thereafter, those who had been suspected of involvement in banditry were deported to Zimbabwe. Overall then, apart from Botswana's discreet sympathy, Zapu's former allies treated Nkomo and his party as if they were radioactive. But Zanu's position in relation to its own former wartime partners was very different. Tanzanian President Julius Nyerere had really pretended to be even handed with regard to the rivalry between ZANU and ZAPU. He had, for example, vigorously supported Mugabe against Nkomo during the elections of February 1980, when ZANU had used ZAMLA to guarantee the vote in China speaking areas. And Tanzania now provided active assistance to ZANU PF during the Kukarahundi. South African documents show that 15 Tanzanian radio operators were seconded to Fire Brigade, filling a critical operational gap created by the exclusion of ex zipper personnel. So your last statement, you're talking about 15 radio operators uh, being um, seconded. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll go over that again. Just feel free to interrupt me again if there's another issue. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I was saying that uh, um, South African documents demonstrate that 15 Tanzanian radio operators, uh, men from the Tanzanian army, were seconded to Fire Brigade, filling a critical operational gap created by the, the exclusion of ex zipra personnel and by a lack of ex zana personnel with sufficient skills. Two other ZANU allies also provided men who operated with Fire Brigade in Matabili land. Multiple witnesses have spoken of Portuguese speakers who were part of Fire Brigade. And these were almost certainly Mozambican forces provided by Samora Marshall. Mugabe hated Marshall, but was still happy to use him. And the Mozambican president owed his counterpart a debt after November 1982, when Mugabe had authorised the ZNA to assist Frelimo in an increasingly desperate struggle against the rebel group Renamo. It's not yet clear what precise role Mozambique's, Mozambican forces fulfilled within the brigade, but they were there. Then there was North Korea, which of course had trained the uh, Five Brigade at Nyanga. But what's been less well publicized is that at least four North Koreans went into Matabi land alongside the brigade. In addition, the Koreans trained a sixth brigade, which became an early version of the Presidential Guard. And this unit operated alongside Five Brigade in Matabi land south during 1984. Yeah. 
activities of the Presidential Guard have been almost entirely omitted from accounts of the Gukurahundi, but this unit committed significant atrocities similar to those of Five Brigade. Okay, so that sums up the contrasting positions of two groups of foreign countries in regard to the Gukurahundi. Former uh, ZAPU allies and then friends of ZANU who were not so much former allies, but rather active supporters and co-perpetrators. Um, so moving on to the West, we'll focus here on the period uh, January to April 1983, because the interactions between Western countries and the Mugabe government in this phase established the pattern for their dealings during the rest of Gukurahundi. I'll then give a brief uh, overview of what happened during the rest of 1983 and then the deployment of Five Brigade to Mat South in 1984. By the way, the following account uh, draws on previously classified documents from the United States, Canada, Australia and South Africa. And I'm also drawing on two studies by uh, Hazel Cameron who's written about the British and American responses to the killings. Right, so I mentioned that Five Brigade was deployed on the 20th of January, 1983. There's no evidence that Western diplomats knew in advance that Five Brigade was being sent in to perpetrate mass killings, but they became aware of the atrocities soon after deployment. Apart from hearing Zapu's statements and reading the growing number of international news reports. Diplomats had a range of private sources. These sources included the Catholic Church, NGOs, and members of the CIO, the National Army, and Zona PF. As is normally the case, diplomats were also sharing information with each other. During February 1983, the debate in diplomatic circles essentially revolved around three questions. How extensive were the killings? Who was directing Five Brigade? And then what should be done? An attempt to summarize this debate in just a few minutes brings with it the risk of oversimplification, but there's a couple of observations and generalizations that can be made. One of them is that Western representatives were slow to go to Matabiland to conduct their own investigations. They were asking con uh, questions of their contacts, but not traveling to Matabiland themselves. The contrast between diplomats and the activities of Western journalists illustrates this point. Within a day or so of Zapu's allegations in parliament at the end of January, three foreign correspondents had entered the area of five brigade operations undercover. The fact that the uh, first visit uh, by a Western diplomat to Matabiland didn't occur until uh, the 16th of February. A member of the British High Commission went to Bulawayo on the 16th of February. and uh, But by that time, hundreds more people had been uh, killed by Five Brigade. This sluggish response meant that the debate about the scale of Five Brigade atrocities was still going on between Western diplomats, when others had already drawn their conclusions and were making uh, approaches to the Mugabe government. Again, um, in terms of contrast, the Catholic Church had by the 12th of February already compiled a file with the names of 250 victims and were trying to get it to Mugabe. In a cover letter, the Bishop of Bulawayo, Henry Carlin, told Mugabe that he was surprised that the government pretended to be unaware of, and uh, I'm quoting here, unaware of the behavior and brutal approach of Fifth Brigade who terrorize and intimidate the population through the murder of men, women, and children. He also wrote of his fear that quote, a policy of genocide was being contemplated. At the other end of the spectrum, five days later, the British High Commissioner, Robin Byatt, 
was telling his headquarters in London, it's extremely difficult to get a really accurate picture of the extent of 5th Brigade brutality. The behaviour of the 5th Brigade has certainly been brutal, but it is our impression that they're not out of control. A day later, he was forced to revise that conclusion. He'd spoken to a British missionary who'd been living in Matt North and by it then wrote to London. The missionary's reports substantiate allegations of widespread act, acts of brutality through, throughout the communal lands where five brigade are deployed. He's personally witnessed many of these acts, that's the missionary, and most seem well authenticated. They range from murder to torture, rape and beatings. Men, women and children have been victims. The brutality seems systematic and is, and is indiscriminately directed against villagers to whom they are reported to have said, all Ndebele are dissidents. The reports suggest that the number killed since Fire Brigade was deployed may well be substantially more than the couple of hundred I postulated in my previous telegram. Other countries were coming to similar conclusions at this point, though they didn't send anyone to Matabililand to investigate during the rest of February. On the same day as the British High, Commission, High Commissioner sent his revised assessment, the 18th of February, the Canadians wrote to their headquarters that, quote, soldiers of five brigade have been sweeping through Matabililand causing heavy civilian casualties. The Americans, sorry, un, uh, end of quote. The Americans for their part said that, quote, five brigade have been moving from village to village sorting people out. The Americans estimated that a thousand had been killed and that thousands more had been injured. These conclusions placed a greater focus on the question of who was di directing Five Brigade and what should be done about it. As far as action was concerned, the ball was left in Britain's court during the remainder of February and nobody else made approaches to Zona Pierre. And the method adopted by the British was to talk to Zanu ministers in polite and non-accusatory terms during the course of their normal interactions, but not to make appointments for the exclusive purpose of discussing events in Matabililand. The tone of these interactions is captured by the advice that the head of the British military assistance program gave to Rex Nongo and Shebagava. The policy, uh, and this is a quote, the policy of military repression of dissidents, he said, has dangers and requires careful handling to avoid excesses. One thing to point out here is that according to diplomatic traditions, there's a significant difference between informal interactions and what's known as a demarche which is when an, uh, sorry, when an ambassador goes to the government and says, this is the position of my government on this matter. He or she might also hand over a note at that point, which lays out the position of their government. Uh, so, uh, you know, high, high commissioners and ambassadors frequently have uh, informal discussions with uh, ministers, but when they want to make a particularly serious point, they'll do what's known as a demarche, which is a formal, a formal representation uh, uh, to the host government. And I'm just saying, or I was just saying that uh, no demarches were made uh, to the Zanu PF government by Western countries in February 1983 at the height of the uh, killings. So uh, I'll go on from there. So it was only in the first and second weeks of March when it became clear that uh, rampant carnage was continuing, that a greater sense of urgency developed and that consideration was given by different Western countries that they should make formal representations to the Mugabe government. British High Commissioner Bayat met with Sekar Amai Sydney uh, Sekaramai, the minister responsible for defence, 
on the 4th of March. And uh, he, uh, he said, this is what he said, or this is what he reported to London. I urged Thekar Amai strongly to ensure that excesses were curbed and that while military force was needed, no more was used than was essential to the requirement of the moment. The, uh, the US ambassador, Robert Keeley, followed up a day later when diplomats gathered at Harare airport to farewell Mugabe and a number of ministers who were flying out to an international conference. Keeley had given finance minister Bernard Chizero a stack of American newspaper articles about the killings and had included a cover note saying that the Reagan administration might find it difficult to get the blessing of Congress for further aid money for Zimbabwe if the atrocities continue. Chizero asked whether he could show the papers to Mugabe, who would be sitting next to him during the flight. And Keeley encouraged him to do so. Keeley later found out that Mugabe had poured over the papers for more than an hour, reading and rereading the articles and comparing them with each other. This appears to have been a crucial episode, which combined with other pressures on Mugabe, convinced him that the intensity of the killings must be toned down. Some of the other pressure points included a meeting with Carlin and the, uh, the Catholic bishops before he left on his trip. Another meeting with a group of NGOs who gave him a file containing, containing photos of the atrocities. And then, the, uh, and then there were further representations by diplomats to Zani ministers while Mugabe was away. He would have been given, uh, or he would have been informed about those approaches whilst he was overseas. There were also uh, a series of other very negative press reports in the international media during his trip. The killings were still in full swing uh, on the day Mugabe had left. In fact, the largest massacre of the period, the killing of 62 people in northern Lupane, occurred on that day, 5th of March. It's also not a coincidence that the attempt on Nkomo's life was made on, on the night of the 5th of March, after Mugabe had flown out of the country. Mugabe seems to have often left uh, at or around the time of a major operation, or sorry, at the time a major operation was about to be executed. For example, he flew out of the country on the 20th, of, or he had flown out of the country on the 20th of January, the day Fire Brigade went into Matabele Land. Uh, documents from South African intelligence confirm that Mugabe issued instructions for a change of approach in Matabele Land during his trip overseas or, or at around about the time he returned. One of those documents reads as follows. Five Brigade received orders to better treat the local population in Matabele Land as a consequence of the negative international public publicity that the actions of the fifth of the fifth brigade had received. On the ground surveys also indicate that the number of deaths diminished significantly after this point. Five brigade remained in Matabili land for the rest of 1983, but changed strategy, increasing the proportion of killings in relation, sorry, of beatings in relation to killings and taking a more secretive approach to the disposal of bodies. Diplomats asked occasional questions of their contacts, contacts and sent occasional reports home on the matter, but did nothing else for the rest of the year. There's a couple of key points to make here about Mugabe's behavior. First, 
despite his aggressive and unyielding action, or sorry, public attitude in the face of accusations of atrocities, he showed himself to be privately sensitive to external pressure. Some of this seems to have been fear of exposure for what he knew to be crimes under international law. There were also things like the problems that would be created if the British removed military assistance or if the Americans withdrew financial aid. The government was overspending and was already knocking on the IMF's door for assistance at this stage. A second key point is that 1983 taught Mugabe he could beat and kill his fellow Zimbabweans and nobody would do anything as long as he kept the violence below a certain threshold or appeared to keep it that way. In this respect, he had understood the, way, uh, the position of Western countries correctly, even if those countries did not articulate their stance in such unvarnished terms. In other words, Western powers had made a decision or effectively made a decision that political violence would not produce a crisis point in their relations with the ZANU-PF government unless such violence involved extensive killings over a sustained period. I'll talk about the reasons for that decision in, in a minute. The events of 1984 de demonstrated the newly established relational dynamics between Mugabe and the West. The nature of Five Brigade's violence in Matt South mirrored the more discreet operations that had occurred in Matt North from March 1983. More of the violence was concentrated in hidden enclaves such as Balagwe and the bodies of those who died were taken away at night and thrown, uh, sorry, thrown down mine shafts uh, and so on. The denial of food uh, during the worst drought in living memory, a strategy that had formed part of ZNA operations in 1982 and 1983, now became a centerpiece of five brigades operations. Liquidation through starvation brought with it a greater degree of, uh, of plausible deniability. The intention was that people would die alone at their homesteads from purportedly natural causes with the numbers remaining unknown. And that's precisely what happened. The lethargic response of the West in 1984 is striking, particularly given the redeployment of the same unit that had so recently slaughtered thousands of people in Matabeleland North. Certainly others were ready for the likelihood that major atrocities were about to reoccur. The Catholics, for example, had made special preparations to be in a position to gather information. And ZAPU also began to blow the whistle as early as January. It was only when mass starvation became a possibility that serious consideration was given by Western representatives to approaching the government. In this respect, the Americans were the most forthright, speaking to Munangagwa and others in government about the food blockade during March. The British, after downplaying the severity of the situation, finally began to speak privately on the matter in late March, when a rash of international press reporting on Matt South occurred. Most of the others were still talking among themselves about whether to speak up when the government lifted the curfew and the worst of the food in embargo on the 9th of April. Mugabe's decision to wind things back in April 1984 seems to have come from a combination of firstly increasing international press reporting, secondly pressure from the Catholic Church 
including a meeting with Bishop Carlin and others on the 6th of April. And thirdly, American ins insistence that 30,000 tonnes of food aid for Zimbabwe would not be delivered unless there was a guarantee that Matt South would be adequately uh, provided for uh, as a part of that food aid. A crude summary of the response of Western governments to Gukurahundi during 1983 and 1984 uh, might be as follows. Rapid awareness that atrocities were occurring, slow movement toward their own investigations, reluctant and late representations to the ZANU-PF government, representations that nevertheless had an impact, and then a sigh of relief and no further action when five brigade atrocity, uh, sorry, activities continued at a lower level. So what were the reasons for why Western countries were on the whole so reluctant to damage their relationship with the Mugabe government by making rapid and forceful interventions over the atrocities? This is a pretty complex question, um, but I'm gonna highlight the following five reasons. Number one, Mugabe had adopted adopted an independent foreign policy, choosing not to align Zimbabwe with the communist bloc. And the Western powers wanted to keep it that way. A member of the British Foreign Office put it this way when the controversy over the Gukurahundi blew up in 1983. And I'm quoting, there was a British concern that if the UK showed any less than full confidence in Mugabe, he might move much further away from the West and closer to the Soviet Union and its satellites such as North Korea, unquote. Likewise, the, new, the US analysis at the same point was this. Our policy towards Zimbabwe since independence was to build upon the constructive role we played in support of the British and the independence process and upon the basic anti-Soviet animus of Mugabe and ZANU. This is what we used to cement or have used to cement good relations between us, unquote. The second reason for the Western response is that Western countries wanted Zimbabwe to be regarded as a successful capitalist multiracial experiment so that this would encourage the ANC and the whites to negotiate a similar solution in South Africa. A rupture between the ZANU-PF government and the West, and for example, an associated exodus of the white community from Zimbabwe, along with an economic collapse, would, the West thought, undermine the attempt to hold up Zimbabwe as a shining light for the region. When reflecting on the tumultuous events of early 1983, the Canadian High Commissioner put it this way in May of that year. Our interests in Zimbabwe remain unchanged. Zimbabwe has not ceased to be the hope for multiracial democratic economic development, which could be a model for Africa and for the even more vexing issue of the future development of the Republic of South Africa. We must continue to offer all possible support and attempt to steer Zimbabwe in the right direction." End of quote. A third reason for the West's position was that Zim was seen as a possible or actual economic partner. The British on their side had 800 million pounds worth of investment in Zimbabwe and had done about 120 million pounds worth of trade with Zim in 1982. Others like the Canadians explicitly referred to Zimbabwe's trade potential when discussing how to manage the problems caused by Gukurahundi. Uh, 
the fourth reason for the Western attitude was, uh, no, excuse me, the fourth reason uh, when we're looking at the West's response was that Britain was the leading external power in Zimbabwe and its international prestige was bound up with the success of the ZANU-PF government. The expectation during the Lancaster House negotiations and the elections of 1980, this is on the British side, the expectations were that the independence process was likely to be a disaster. The British were surprised that the war didn't restart and that Mugabe took a moderate approach toward the economy and the whites. And the British had also received a lot of kudos in Africa and further afield for the Lancaster House process and the elections. They referred to this as, quote, Lancaster House prestige. That's in one of the documents. And they wanted to believe that Matabililand was a brief anomaly that would soon pass. Moreover, the Gukurahundi hadn't impacted Mashonaland or the economy or the white community. And given that these were some of the key metrics by which they measure, measured Mugabe's behavior, he was a moderate. The fifth and the last reason that I'm gonna uh, touch on for the Western attitude during Gukurahundi is that a number of key individuals in the diplomatic community had become emotionally involved with Mugabe and with ZANU-PF. They saw ZANU ministers all the time. They socialized with them after hours. Their wives were friends with ZANU wives and the diplomats didn't travel outside of Harare as often as they might have. Some examples are Robin Byatt, the British High Commissioner, Colin Shortus, the head of the British Military Assistance Program, and Jeremy Herder, the Australian High Commissioner. All three had a tendency to downplay reports of the atrocities, to react slowly, and to instinctively take the government's side often swallowing ZANU-PF propaganda hook, line and sinker. There's a standard joke in diplomatic circles about people who become too involved with the host government, namely that our ambassador is no longer representing us. He's now representing the foreign government to us. And there's a strong sense in which, the, in which people like uh, the three that I mentioned became Zimbabwe's representatives to Britain or Australia rather than the other way around. Some examples of the tendencies I've mentioned are as follows. In Herder's case, when Nkormo fled the, the country to Botswana after the assassination attempt, Herder wrote to Canberra that it was urgent for Mugabe to present his own version of events so as to counter the negative publicity that Nkormo would generate. Two days later, when Western heads of mission met to discuss the policy of a coordinated Daymarsh or representations to the Zimbabwe government, Herder told the group that he had no instructions from his government to make an approach. In fact, he'd already been told by his foreign ministry nine days earlier to seek an appointment with a ZANU minister to express Australian concerns about the atrocities. He eventually got around to it on the 16th of March when he saw Sydney Sekaramai. In the middle of 1983, when there were still reports of atrocities, including the burning of 22 people in a hut in Lupane, Herder wrote this. It's difficult to determine the truth of the allegations at this stage. To say that thousands have been killed since January sounds exaggerated. The general impression that I have from co recent contacts is that the military si situation is better than it has been, but is still unsatisfactory." End of quote. <laughs> 
In March 1984, when the food embargo was operating in Matt South, High Commissioner Herder paid his farewell to call, sorry, his farewell call on Mugabe prior to leaving Zimbabwe, but did not raise Matabili land during the discussion. Instead, instead, it was actually Mugabe who brought the topic up, telling Herder that military commanders may have occasionally strayed a little from the instructions they were given. Taking this as gospel truth, Herder then re relayed the message to his headquarters in Australia. And this is what he said. Contrary to instructions, security force commanders had taken things too far in denying food supplies to the area, unquote. Pro-ZANU diplomats were not the only influence on their country's foreign policies. As I've uh, said, there were plenty of other factors in the equation, but there can be little doubt that these people, these people with ZANU sympathies uh, had a, an influence and there were probably certain points where that influence was critical. So then, uh, to conclude, what are we going to make of the position of external players during the Gukurahundi? Should Western countries have done more? And what about the actions of ZAPU's former allies who went MIA or ZANU's allies who actively assisted? Well, those aren't really questions for historians. They're questions for citizens and for policy, policy makers. It isn't the job of a historian to enter the moral debate or the policy debate on what should or shouldn't have happened. The job of a historian is to investigate what happened and why it happened, not to get in, into what should have happened. Of course, as an individual, I've got views on those things, but when speaking as a historian, I'm gonna try and, try and stay out of that and stick to fundamental historical questions. So it's over to you guys, and I hope that what you've heard today will help provide some of the data you need to have an informed uh, debate. Thank you. And uh, back to you, Zenzele. Thank you very much, Stuart. At least the, the last part was now um, much clearer. I have uh, two questions for you. I think maybe we might take one or two sure. questions from the audience. My two questions, the first one is, you have studied this a lot. Uh, we have always had debates on someone. I mean, they, they, back then the army said we killed 500 or less. Uh, there were so many. In your studies, what, what numbers did you circle with? Not that numbers matter, okay. but sometimes yeah. they do. And secondly, sure. do you think, mm. would you say it was a genocide? Okay. Uh, first, with regard to the question of numbers, uh, the, the honest answer is that, that I don't know. I, I actually uh, think uh, there's no way of calculating uh, that figure at this stage. Uh, the figure of 20,000, which is the one that we always hear, uh, that's, that is not a reliable figure. And it's, it's, it's become sort of the uh, go-to figure, if you like, uh, the established figure, but there's no basis for that. It was first uh, suggested by Joshua Nkormo in 1983 when he was writing, writing his book. Um, but that was only halfway through the Gukurahundi, and it was also based on uh, just bits and pieces of information uh, that he was getting from uh, Catholic church sources and so on. So the 20,000 figure uh, shouldn't be quoted and, and can't be relied on. Um, academic researchers have, uh, um, uh, when they've tried to come up with figures have quoted very low figures 
uh, for example, 3000 and figures like that. But that's also unreliable because um, they've only uh, used numbers that could be confirmed from multiple sources. And, uh, you know, you're going to get a, a, a major underestimate with those sort of uh, uh, with those sort of methods. And the other, the other factor there was that uh, most of those surveys, have, uh, well, they've only been done in certain areas like Cholocho, Lupane and Kai. Very little of Mad South has been surveyed in terms of the deaths. As far as I'm aware, there, there's been absolutely no surveys of uh, Silobela and Jombe. Um, so, uh, really, that figure is totally unknown, uh, and the uh, the extent, uh, you know, there's obviously no capacity for um, uh, a comprehensive forensic exploration at this point. I mean, uh, with Zanu PF still in power, um, personally, I think it's a mistake to even begin that process whilst they have control over that. Um, so yeah, the long and the short of it is, is we don't know. Um, and uh, there's a lot of research that still needs to be done on that question. Um, uh, your second question was whether Gukrahundi was a genocide or should be regarded as a genocide. Um, that, that word is uh, uh, thrown around a lot. Um, but it's actually, uh, it's thrown around too loosely in too many situations. It's actually a technical, it's a, it's a technical term and a, uh, that requires two things. The first is a, an international legal process uh, to establish a finding of genocide. And that hasn't occurred in Madabili land or with regard to uh, Gugra Hundi. And the second thing is that it actually requires an expert debate uh, between uh, legal specialists. That also hasn't occurred. Um, so it's not to say that the Gukrahundi was not genocide. I'm not arguing that. I'm just saying that um, for the finding of genocide to be made, uh, you need those two things to occur and they haven't happened up till this point. Uh, in terms of the definition of what a genocide is, uh, roughly speaking, it's the intention to destroy a group, an ethnic group in whole or in part. Uh, and there's certainly uh, strong evidence uh, in that regard, as far as Gukrahundi is concerned, um, but uh, I don't think the, the term genocide should be thrown around loosely um, for no other reason than uh, it reduces the power of that word when a finding of genocide is, is actually made. So what I'm saying is that there's a lot of work to be done uh, uh, in that regard uh, and, and, and we're still waiting for that. There's another question here. The question says, uh, do you believe that the, the important and secret meeting in Maputo in April 1980 between Mozambique, ZANU-PF, uh, Apartheid SA, Rhodesia, facilitated by the British, which dealt with uh, halting ANC countries' operations, dealing with Rhodesia Special Forces and Renamo ETC, would, uh, uh, would also dealt with in the need to destroy Zappo. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm glad I've been asked that question because uh, it's a popular conspiracy theory in Matabili land and it was one that uh, was uh, promoted, heavily promoted by the late Dumiso Dabengwa, among others. And, uh, you know, it's the idea that there was a an international conspiracy led by the British uh, to destroy Zapu. And, uh, you know, there's even the allegation that the British encouraged Gukrahundi and were involved in Gukrahundi. And uh, um, the long and the short of that is that uh, 
there isn't a shred of evidence in that regard. Uh, and in fact, there's a, 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 a huge body of evidence that that's not the case. Um, for example, uh, uh, the British were actually hoping that the first government of Zimbabwe would be formed under Joshua and Cornwall with Joshua and Cornwall as the prime minister and Bishop uh, Muzurewa as a part participant in that government with the whites. And they were not, they were surprised and shocked by the victory of ZANU-PF. And so the idea that uh, the British wanted to destroy ZAPU, uh, the, all the evidence points in the other, the other direction. That's just one reason. Um, another uh, point in that regard is that it's often been said that uh, the South Africans promoted Gukura Hundi. They were happy to see it happen. Um, that's not the case. There's no evidence in that regard. Um, uh, in fact, when I spoke to a general who uh, was one of the key people in uh, South African military intelligence who, who organized Renamo in Mozambique, who organized and supported UNITA in Angola, he said to me that when the Gukura Hundi uh, broke out, it was a shock in South Africa and they realized that their um, ideas of promoting instability in Matabililand through so-called super Zapu would be impossible in a situation where there were such heavy and brutal uh, military operations by uh, the ZNA. So in fact, Gukura Hundi destroyed uh, the possibility of using uh, Super Zapu uh, to destabilize Zimbabwe. So um, those are a couple of the reasons. I don't think those conspiracy theories hold any water. And, uh, you know, I think the other thing is they take away the focus on the true perpetrator, which was Zanu PF from start to finish. It was Zanu PF and Mugabe who perpetrated those things. Um, that's not to say uh, the role of the West shouldn't come under scrutiny, but they were not the perpetrators and uh, um, it was not in their interest to see the, the, the killings continue. Now, whether, 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 they, uh, um, whether you want to characterize their uh, response as incredibly weak, as uh, and as having uh, failed to, uh, um, well, whether you want to speculate that if they'd been more forceful, um, the killings would have been less. That's another. That's another question. But in terms of in terms of British involvement or Western involvement, active involvement in Gukurahundi, there's no evidence for that. So they, maybe one of the last questions is, uh, was there collaboration between apartheid South Africa and ZANPF during Bukuro? Uh Yes, to the extent that not over, not over Gukuro Hundi, there was no collaboration. I've seen no evidence in that regard, but what was occurring is that the ANC uh, sorry, Mugabe had promised the South Africans that the ANC would not be allowed to have bases, military bases in Zimbabwe. And there were frequent meetings between ZANU-PF and uh, South African officials on that issue and on, on, on related issues. Uh, but uh, there were no, there was no coordination uh, with regard to ZNA operations, and in fact, the South Africans struggled to uh, uh, to ascertain what exactly was going on in Matt North in 1983. I spoke to um, a gentleman who was the uh, commander of the uh, South African Signals Operation. Um, a station near uh, what's now Makado, Louis Trickart. Um, they were intercepting ZNA radio traffic uh, 
1983 and, and, and reading a lot of the communications, but because Five Brigade uh, um, was using a different radio system through the Tanzanians and the Korean, uh, Koreans, the South Africans were unable to crack that, uh, um, that, those communications. And this, uh, this commander told me that uh, they didn't know what was going on. They weren't able to intercept those communications and they were uh, very unsure of what was happening. Um, so they were relying on human intelligence through their mission in, uh, in Harare. And uh, those guys were picking up bits and pieces through the CIO and so on, but uh, no, I, I've seen no no uh, suggestion at all that there was actual coordination between those two governments. Um, uh, thank you very much for this uh, enlightening uh, presentation. We hope because of the uh, sort of for the initially we 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 had uh, internet challenges, but uh, the, I'm good uh, happy that it worked out, and I hope probably we'll get a copy of the presentation. Then uh, we can post it on our website so that people can follow up on their own, and uh, the arguments will continue. But um, I'm happy that we we had this conversation and uh, we every day we, we get new information because uh, like you said, Kukuraund is one area that is understudied. We have relied on a few people uh, who have told us their stories, their theories, but maybe we need to research deeper and even harder to find out some of the sources, some of the people who are involved that we have not talked to. Unfortunately, not so many of the 5th Brigade people have uh, uh, come out and to tell us what is uh, what has been happening and that might be the case. But maybe my question is, uh, last question, this is, I yeah. promise. Have yeah, you, no, did no, you no. ever uh, talk to anyone who was in the 5th Brigade? Uh, that's, that's an extremely difficult uh, prospect. That's, a, that's an extremely difficult challenge for obvious reasons. Uh, um, you know, uh, I'm aware of certain people who were involved in Matabuland at that time, but um, uh, there's there's obviously a deep reluctance. One of one of the one of the uh, things that you'll notice about uh, ex Zanla people and their uh, when they uh, in almost all circumstances when they reminisce and talk about uh, their, their time in Zanla or the ZNA, the story ends in about 1980. They, they, they will say very little about anything post-independence uh, and nothing about what happened in 1983 and 1984. Um, uh, so I think, uh, yeah, that's, that's a hard nut to crack. I, 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 I don't think... Uh, um, you know, it, there's there's anyone uh, anytime soon who's going to volunteer to come on to your show to uh, make a full disclosure. Um, so, but uh, I would say that uh, with the continuing disintegration of ZANU PF, things may change in future. Um, uh, so we'll see. Let's see. Yeah, thank you very much on that note. Yeah, it's, it's very difficult. You hardly, you would never, ever, ever uh, I mean, find someone who's saying, oh, I'm, I'm ready to tell the story. And obviously, it's for obvious reasons. They know, I mean, the, the Korean training was, I guess, part of it, but also they know the consequences, especially if ZANPF is still in power. They don't want to implicate anyone. So it would take maybe, I don't know how many years uh, for anyone to come and say, I want to give you full to close, uh, a close of what happened. Just like people who were born after Kukuraundi would actually defend Kukuraundi as something that was necessary, something that was there and something that uh, had to happen. So there, there has been a lot of indoctrination, if I were to use that word for sure. Those who were there in the younger generation on the issue of Kukuraon. So thank you very much, Stuart, for your time. I know it's uh, it's evening where you are. So I uh, wish you a good night. And that was the the lecture with Stuart Doran where we're looking at the role of the international community uh, during Kukuraon. So for those who are watching, uh, thank you very much. And the next time we meet, uh, we'll be talking to uh, actually uh, Jeremy Breckhill will be giving us uh, a public lecture on uh, Zipra, and it will be called Zipra the people's army. Uh, till we meet again, have a good day.